everyone for joining today's webinar, and at this time I'd like to turn it over to Jim. Thank you, and welcome everybody to the April edition of HBK Manufacturing Solutions webinar, and today's topic is something that has been very much at the forefront of the business and financial news the last month or so, and it's uh, the banking crisis. It's, it's a topic that everybody seems to uh, want to learn more about, and it's uh, somewhat hard to understand. So with that in mind, we brought in uh, one, of our, one of our experts from our sister company, HBKS, um, HBKS Wealth Advisors. Uh, we have Brian Summers, who's our is a principal and is a chief investment officer at HBKS to help help us talk about this and uh, walk us through it and give us his thoughts and we'll add some of our own. And um, I have today with me, as usual, Amy Reinald, who's a senior manager and the Western Pennsylvania Regional Director of HBK Manufacturing Solutions. And I think up on the screen you will soon see Brian Summers. There he is. Uh, as I mentioned, Brian is a Chief Investment Officer at HBKS Wealth Advisors, our sister company. So uh, we approached Brian uh, for assistance on this, and, and he gladly agreed um, to help. And it's a the, the, everybody has seen the news about Silicon Valley Bank and some of the others, and it's we've gotten a lot of questions from our clients as to how their banking relationship might be affected or not affected by what's currently going on. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and um, let him give us uh, some of his views. And, but our agenda here today is just to have a, an overview of the whole banking crisis, talk about the bank failures, and then really I think where it's really relevant to the manufacturers or what, what are some options that you have and what are some suggestions that we may have for uh, manufacturing and other companies? Manufacturing distribution really would apply to uh, uh, many different types of companies. So let me turn it over to Brian and let him get started. But before I do that, uh, for CP or yes, CP purposes, if you would please confirm your attendance. All right. All you, Brian. Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much, Jim, and uh, happy to be here. Uh, so, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about um, what happened, uh, what caused the, the banking crisis, and, and I'll also talk a little bit about how that impacts the overall economy. Um, you know, l looking at, at uh, the economic environment and what was going on whenever the banking crisis happened, um, you know, the, the economic data was actually coming in a lot stronger than uh, many economists expected. And there was the sense that um, the Federal Reserve was, was going to be able to successfully uh, navigate the economy into the soft landing uh, scenario. Um, however, that all changed on March 10th when uh, – Silicon Valley Bank, uh, SVB, closed due to a run on its deposits. Um, and the, the bank's failure was caused by several issues, uh, some which were unique to SVB and, and some which were not. So, some are uh, common to, to many other mid-sized banks. But essentially, SVB was the bank of choice for many technology startups. And these companies were being flooded with cash. And as a result, they were depositing that cash with SVB. And SVB went from $60 billion in total deposits to nearly $200 billion in deposits in just two years. And so they, they needed to do something uh, with all of that cash. And so in order to, return, to make a return on, on that cash, they invested these deposits in longer-term U.S. Treasuries and, and mortgage-backed securities. That was happening at the same time that the Federal Reserve was substantially raising interest rates 
to combat inflation. And, and this caused two problems. Uh, first of all, the how quickly the Fed was raising rates and how quickly interest rates were rising meant that the value of those treasuries and mortgage-backed securities fell pretty rapidly. Um, and then the other thing that happened is that startup funding became a lot more difficult to access. And so uh, SVB, uh, as well as Signature, Signature Bank, um, their clients needed to withdraw their cash. And, and that forced um, the banks to sell bonds to fund the withdrawals. But the bonds they were selling had already lost so much value, they were selling them at a loss. And as a matter of fact, SVB um, accrued $1.8 billion in losses. And uh, so that's what caused the banks to shut down. And then after they shut down, uh, and Signature Bank shut down, several other banks seemed to be vulnerable, um, especially First Republic Bank. And thankfully, federal regulators stepped in to backstop all depositors uh, at, at these banks and facilitated their sale to uh, other banks. Um, and meanwhile, political leaders in Washington, D.C. debated whether the current regulatory oversight is sufficient and whether FDIC limits should be increased. Now, other banks also have unrealized in their investment portfolios, and that's what caused you know, what some people refer to the, as the crisis. The, the concern is that if there was a run on their assets that, um, or, or their deposits, they would have to sell their assets at a loss as well. Um, however, from our perspective, there seems to be a lot of key differences between what happened with uh, SVB and Signature and other banks, which is why it didn't turn into a, a larger crisis. First of all, larger banks are deemed to be safer because they're deemed to be too big to fail. So some of the, the, the huge national banks, um, you know, the federal government would step in and, and save them because it would be a systemic crisis if they would fail. So they, the government won't allow them to fail. Um, however, the, where the problem was was in some of the other mid-sized banks because – Close to half of the deposits in all banks are in banks with less than $250 billion in assets or what would be considered mid-sized banks. Um, so that was the concern, that there would be a run on deposits in these mid-sized banks, and they would, have to, they would be in a similar situation where they would have to um, get rid of bonds at a loss, and, and which would cause them to fail as well. Uh, but most of these mid-sized banks have a much more diverse clientele, and most of their clients' accounts are typically smaller and fully covered by FDIC insurance. Um, so, so that's why, in addition to what the government did, um, th that's why it didn't turn into a, a full systemic crisis. Ryan, if I could interrupt with a question, a question that many of our clients ask is, how can, how can I tell if my bank is not doing the same things that uh, Silicon Valley Bank did? How, how, can they, how, can, how can they be assured or get some satisfaction that the, if, they're not, if they are dealing with mid-sized and community banks, which many of our clients are, how can they get any comfort that their bank is uh, maybe not in a similar situation? Yeah, that, that's a, a really good question, and, and it's, it's, it's very hard to tell. Um, and because it's so hard to tell, um, there has been a lot of people who have um, taken their deposits out of these mid-sized banks and, and put them in with the larger, you know, too big to fail banks. Um, which which could cause an issue, um, 
But as long as, you know, if, if, if you would look at your bank and say, okay, does that bank have a specific clientele um, that is a very narrow niche um, that could be subject to the same sort of situation as what um, SVB Bank's clientele were subject to. And that is, you know, they, they have a, a need for cash in a very short period of time. Um, if, as long as a mid-sized bank doesn't have a small niche clientele, and, and most of them don't, most of them have a broader clientele um, and, and won't be subject to that. Um, also, you can look and say, okay, what is the average size of the deposit base? And if a bank caters to very wealthy people, then th that could be a problem because um, they're going to have a lot of accounts that aren't fully covered by FDIC insurance, and so there might be a reason for them to withdraw their funds. Um, however, the vast majority of mid-sized banks have a more diverse clientele with smaller accounts that are fully covered by FDIC. So yeah, those are probably the, the two main factors, a diverse clientele and accounts that are uh, covered by FDIC insurance. And I, I would say that would cover the vast majority of mid-sized banks. Um, you know, th there's only a, a handful of banks that don't fit that criteria, and, and they're probably, um, you know, geographically located in, in areas that would be on the coasts, not necessarily in the middle part of the country. Okay. The other, the other question I guess I would pose to, to something you said that, that a lot of our clients are concerned with, when it comes to the big banks, um, you know, the, the national banks, the top ten banks, the government, you mentioned that the government would step in. Um, and and I've, I've thought that, too, and said that, you know, they, they, they're not going to let a, a Bank of America or a Citibank fail. But others have pointed out to me, well, 2008, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers went under. What, I guess what's the – what would be the difference between now and 2008 um, where maybe the government would, would, would step in and not let a, uh, a big bank uh, meet the same fate that they did back in 2008? You know, probably the biggest thing is that um, there were some changes to the regulatory requirements that those larger banks face. And um, so now they are um, – there are much more stringent liquidity requirements, but they have to keep um, a, a, a much higher percentage of, of cash on hand than they had to prior to um, the, the financial crisis in 08. And I would say that that would, would give – it gives people some comfort that even if there would be a, a broader systemic issue, these banks would be fine because they have been stress test over and over again over the last you know um, 15 years or so, um, and they the more stringent liquidity requirements um, have enabled them to pass these stress tests. Uh, so I think that's probably the biggest thing that that gives people comfort. Um, and then the other thing is that after the government saw what happened in the great financial crisis, um, not only did it spur them to um, make the banks have more stringent liquidity requirements, but it also convinced them that they, if, if there would be any issues with these larger banks, they would step in pretty quickly, I believe. You know, there has been some talk already of, uh, raising the FDIC limits. Um, you know, currently it's 250,000 of deposits are covered under FDIC. Uh, the government is talking about raising that potentially to, to 400,000, which would um, calm the nerves if something would happen. Okay, thank you. I'll let you, I'll let you get back on track now after I 
after I took a little detour there. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, looking at, at you know, some of the banks that, that we've talked about that have failed, they have had some very specific issues, um, some very different characteristics than your normal, traditional um, small commercial bank. You know, if you look at uh, Silvergate, uh, they had a very um, niche clientele uh, in the cryptocurrency sector, which has been a very volatile asset. Um, you know, 90 percent of their deposits were cryptocurrency related. And so they have been under pressure uh, for some time now since the, the whole cryptocurrency um, industry has been under pressure. And so they have had to sell assets at a steep loss as well. Um, you know, they had over $1 billion in, in, in losses. And uh, even before the issues with SVB, they had laid off um, – 40% of their workforce. So they were a bank that was in in trouble even before this happened. Um, so it wasn't real surprising that that uh, they were caught up in this crisis as well. Um, but again, they had a specific clientele, a very niche market, um, not a broad-based um, clientele. And then with SVB, uh, same thing, you know, we've already talked about that, about their very niche client with the venture capital and startup uh, um, clientele uh, is the main reason for their problems because as uh, startup capital was drying up because of interest rates rising, they needed to withdraw their cash. And so they were caught in a very difficult situation. Um, and then with Signature Bank, uh, you know, again, a very niche clientele, uh, which is what caused the, the run on their assets. And so I think, you know, the common theme that we can take away is that all of the banks that got into trouble um, were involved in not only very niche clientele, but also high-risk niche client, clients. Um, you know, whether it's the startup industry or cryptocurrencies, um, you know, all of their, their customers or a very, very large number of their customers were involved in these type of businesses. And so they were prone uh, to any type of broad economic forces that would impact that industry, um, which, again, isn't the case for, for most uh, commercial banks. And then uh, with with Credit Suisse, you know that was kind of a a different issue. Um, you know uh, they, they they were the second largest bank in Switzerland, and throughout history they have have faced several scandals. Um, you know that they were one of the primary banks for uh, Nazi Germany. Um, and, and some of their um, leaders hiding their cash. And, and so, you know, throughout history, there have been a lot of um, scandals that they've been involved in. Um, and then they were also caught up in the situation with uh, they extended their, their investments into very long-term investments. Um, and it was a mismatch between their their um, their assets and their liabilities on their balance sheet, and so people became concerned because they had such a, a large mismatch on their balance sheet that if there would be a run, that they wouldn't be able to fund them. And you know, as one thing that I I, I think is true about the banking industry is that. The banking industry works as long as uh, people have confidence in it. Whenever people lose confidence in a bank, um, it's going to fail. You know, one of the uh, analogies that I like to point out is 
um, you know, especially now with the advent of Internet banking, people can get on their phones and they can withdraw their money in seconds on their phone without even seeing a human being. You know, it's not like if, if anybody saw the movie It's a Wonderful Life, whenever um, the, the town came into George Bailey's bank, You know, George was there at the teller window convinced, trying to convince people to not to withdraw their money. You know, there's no George Bailey um, tr trying to convince people not to withdraw their money whenever you can just put, hit, click a button on your phone. And, and that was the biggest issue with Credit Suisse is that um, people ca became concerned and, and they just they, they ran for the exits. Um, and whenever they ran for the exit, uh, the, the, the Saudi National Bank, which could have stepped in, uh, chose not to. And, and that's what caused the bank to fail. Um, you know, I know if you, a, a lot of the people in the Swedish government, um, and in Switzerland have, have, uh, blamed the problems in the United States for the problems of the credit, of Credit Suisse. Um, you know, I don't necessarily buy that. I think it was a, a contributing factor, um, but the main problem was the mismatch in their um, assets versus their liabilities. And, and in the end, they were purchased by UBS. So, so in each case here that, we, that we've gone through, each of these banks has, has a different, different set of scenarios and um, it really maybe more coincidental that they all – failed at approximately the same time rather than rather than them being evidence of, of a larger banking crisis is, is, is what I'm hearing. That's right. I, I, you know, they, they all were exposed to similar issues, but for different reasons. Um, and but the, the factor which then pushed them all uh, over the cliff was the fact that they had been mismanaging their, their balance sheet and had been uh, looking for return. Uh, in a very low interest rate environment, the only way to, you know, the, the way a bank makes money is to spread um, the difference between what they're paying depositors and what they're earning on their investments. And the only way to increase that spread is to, in, especially in a very low-rate environment where, where they're not making much money, is to buy riskier and riskier assets, longer-term assets. And, uh, you know, whenever the Federal Reserve was hiking rates so aggressively, you know, they, they were raising rates at a, a faster clip than ever has been done in history. Um, you know, there was bound to be something that was going to break. Um, but it was impossible to know what, what that would be. Well, now we know that one of the first things to break was some of these, some of these specific banks that had been reaching too far and, and, and buying riskier and riskier assets to increase their profitability. So, you know, going back to your earlier question, you know, for those who would have access to looking at the bank's balance sheet, that would be the other thing that would help give somebody comfort is, you know, what have they been investing in? And have they been investing in, in assets that are either more risky than they normally would or much longer duration than they normally would? Um, some banks did. Most banks didn't. So then moving along to, uh, you know, do, do we see other banks failing? Do we, you know, what, the, what is going forward? What could, what could people expect or, or what might they see? Well, you know, I would never say never um, because who knows what could happen. I mean, no one could have predicted this. You know what, that these banks would fail just you know six months ago, but um, I think it's unlikely. I, I think that um, 
the fact that there were very specific characteristics of these banks that catered to very specific clients, um, that the very dramatic increase in interest rates that the Fed engineered caused stress on those industries where their clients were focused on. Um, you know, I would say that if, if I was concerned about any area next, um, the commercial lending area is an area that has been under pressure. Um, you know, with the advent of the pandemic and people working from home, um, there's a much higher percentage of the population not going into an office. And so many companies don't need as much office space as they did prior to the pandemic. And so prices in the commercial um, real estate market have been coming down. And so, you know, that would be the next area that I, I would say I would be somewhat concerned about if, you know, if a bank is very highly exposed to the commercial lending market, um, that might be an area of concern. But most banks these days, you know, once they make the loans, they they syndicate them and they sell them. So um, it shouldn't be an issue for for the broad um, banking industry in general. Um, but it it could be for you know a handful of banks. Um, but I, I think the broader uh, result will be the banking industry in general is tightening their lending standards as a result of this. They are not making the loans that they were making prior to, to this happening because they don't want to make loans that would be, be deemed too risky, and they want to make sure that they keep enough liquidity on hand. And that tightening of lending standards is already being seen in fewer loans being made. Um, there's been a pretty dramatic downturn in loan volumes, and economic growth was already beginning to slow. And so it's highly likely, in my mind, that the tightening in lending standards and the lower loan volumes um, in an environment where their growth was already slowing and rates were already rising, that it's highly likely that um, it's going to be, it's going to cause a recession to occur uh, sooner rather than later. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, it, it's possible that we might already be in a recession. Um, a lot of times a recession isn't identified until you're already in it. And um, a lot of the, the data that I've been looking at support that we're going to be in a recession uh, shortly. So that, that would probably be the, the biggest impact that I think the, the problems in the banking industry will have. What's interesting, a couple of things you said there caught my attention. First, the, uh, the, 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 commercial, the commercial real estate as a, as a precursor to another downturn. Um, you know, that's something that we've been hearing I think we started hearing that right after the Great Recession, that you know, the next bubble to burst is the commercial real estate bubble. Um, never really quite happened, but you know, it's, in it's interesting to hear you say that now. And I, the other, the other thing that's interesting, and, and I think very much uh, currently happening with our clients is, is, is the tightening of the uh, tightening of the credit. Uh, Unfortunately, our clients that are primarily, exclusively small, uh, closely held businesses are the ones who will feel the effect of these things that happen that are so far outside of their realm that um, they're the ones that are going to suffer because they're going to have a tougher time obtaining credit. And, and I think we're already starting to see that. So um, I think you're right on with that, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I think you're right, and and then it's going to be exacerbated whenever it, it a, a recession results. Right. The other thing I wanted to mention before we moved on was 
Brian wrote an article which is available on HBKS's website um, that, that kind of summarizes what we just spoke about, including that, that last point on, you know, will other banks fail? Um, so obviously, you know, the recording of this webinar will be available, which, which has some more in-depth information. But if you're, you're looking for a summary of Brian's perspective, um, I know that article was really helpful for me personally, um, and I know for some of our clients, too, to just have a, a quicker summary of, of what's happening. All right, so I think we, do we have another poll question coming up here. So we'll leave it on this slide for a second for the poll question. If you want to take a second and confirm your attendance for CPE purposes, and then we'll move on to options for cash reserves. And here we are. And back to Brian. Yeah, so I, I mentioned that, uh, you know, as as long as uh, people have their accounts in FDIC insured accounts, that you know, there there really is no reason to worry because they're they're covered by insurance. And so what we listed here are the different types of um, accounts that are within a bank that are covered by FDIC insurance which are listed there on the left, uh, which are mostly your traditional uh, banking type of accounts. Uh, but it does not include uh, any type of accounts at a bank where it has the type of investments that are on the right-hand side, um, you know, investments in stocks or bonds or mutual funds or crypto or, you know, you can read the list. Uh, it does not include those type of investments. Um, you know, one other thing that I, I think is important is that uh, you know, at HBKS we've had a lot of questions about, uh, you know, Schwab is uh, our primary custodian, and all of our clients have uh, their assets at Schwab that, that we manage. And so whenever Schwab is in the news, people get concerned and say, is my money safe with you because it's at Schwab? And, and Schwab is a completely different animal than other banks. And I, and I think that's important for people to understand, that Schwab does have a banking unit, but it's a very small part of what they do. Um, where we have our clients' accounts and where the other uh, registered investment advisors and wealth managers who utilize Schwab and Fidelity and other custodians, where we have our clients invested is in a custodial account, not a banking account. And in a custodial account, um, the, a, a, a bank or a financial institution is not able to access those funds in, in the case of a liquidation. Um, those are our clients' assets. They are not commingled with Schwab's assets. They are kept separate and, and are not included in Schwab's assets, which I think is really important. You know, I, I guess the, the way you could think of it is, uh, you know, if, if a bank fails, they can't go into the bank safety deposit boxes and, and take out what you have in your safety deposit box. So a custodial account is like a safety deposit box. They, they cannot get at it. So, um, you know, I think that's an important uh, point to make for anybody that has a custodial account with any of the, uh, you know, Schwab or Fidelity. So in the case, Brian, that a, a bank would fail and a depositor would have, you know, money in that bank that is covered by FDIC insurance, is, is there any normal process that they would have to recover their deposits that were insured? Um, yes, uh, there, there is. And um, I'm not exactly sure what that process would be. I've, I've never gone through it. Um, but I know that, you know, that they would be notified by FDIC um, of, of what they would need to do. There's, uh, you know, some paperwork they would have to fill out. They would have to confirm what the balance was as of a certain date um, and, and submit that to FDIC. Uh, 
and uh, you know, typically it, it might take a matter of weeks before they would uh, uh, be able to access their funds. And then on the next page, it shows uh, other options, which, again, um, you know, different types of investments would be treated differently depending on where they are held. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, an investment manager, um, you know, our advisors at HBKS do a lot of things. Um, not only do we help you uh, – identify what your risk tolerance is, identify what the appropriate asset allocation for your risk tolerance and, and your liquidity needs might be. Um, but then we also will invest those in a very diversified way. Um, you know, we do get a lot of questions about, okay, you know, given all of what's gone on, uh, and given that both stocks and bonds la lost, um, people lost a lot of money last year. It was the worst year uh, for a 60-40 portfolio in a very long time. Uh, what's an investor to do? And, and our advice always is, you know, talk to your financial advisor. Uh, that's what they're there for. Uh, but we, unless there is a reason for needing liquidity in the short term, Typically, our advice is that long-term investors should stick to a disciplined plan, uh, which includes a long-term strategic allocation uh, based on their risk tolerance. And I know that can be very difficult to do after a year like last year, but the last thing you want to do is try to time getting in and out of the markets in a very volatile environment. And, and our financial advisors can help you to not make that mistake and to stay invested, um, maintain a diversified portfolio that you're comfortable with, and, and ride it out through the volatility. Well, I think you, you hit on something that, that we try to hammer home to all of our clients is talk to your advisors, talk to us, talk to your financial advisors. If you don't have financial advisors, we'll hook you up with, with some. Um, some of the things I've seen over the years I've been doing this for 35 years, and, and I, I've seen people go out on the Internet and find the highest-paying CD, um, and it may be from some small little bank in the middle of nowhere, and um, they're looking for the highest return, and you know they may be exposing themselves to some of these risks you talked about before. Um, the, the the weekend warrior, the lone wolf investor, um, I, I've seen uh, too many times where they uh, try to do it themselves and, and maybe get an unwanted uh, result. Um, I, I'm reminded of a of a client of mine who uh, invested in some mutual funds in December of, of a year and um, happened to be a year that those funds threw off huge capital gains and he had to pay tax um, on them. And, uh, he wasn't expecting that, and uh, something that could have been avoided. So, again, for everybody, talk to us. Uh, feel free to call us. Feel free to call. You. I, I encourage you to call your financial advisor if you have one. If you don't, we're um, willing to, to, to help you locate an advisor who's, uh, who can help you. But always, always seek advice. Can't stress that enough. So next we have a poll question. So we'll give you a few seconds to answer that, and then we will talk about some suggestions for manufacturers. Okay, so suggestions for manufacturers. So Brian has given us quite a bit of great information on you know, what's happening, the, the, the different impacts that we've seen for banks, for, for companies who have monies in those banks, and so on and so forth. Um, this first slide should look very familiar to those of you that are 
uh, frequent attendees of our webinars. And, and that's because the same exact slide was in our last month's webinar um, where we were talking about the economic outlook and we were talking about suggestions for manufacturers um, if a recession you know, should approach. And, and that's to ensure adequate liquidity. You know, consider the cash you need for your operations to cover your payroll costs, to cover your fixed costs. Um, you know, certainly as interest rates have gone up over the past several months, um, you know, looking at your debt and determining which of those pieces of debt you may want to pay down more quickly. Um, you know, maybe this time calls for a different utilization strategy for your line of credit. As that interest rate has also increased, you know, maybe you don't want to be borrowing quite as much on that line um, until interest rates are, are a little more stable or, or even on the decline. Forecasting cash, you know, understanding what lies ahead. Um, you know, we've had some clients who continue to have, especially manufacturers, who continue to have very strong performance. Um, we have others who are starting to see or have been seeing a little bit of softening compared to last year. Um, so ensuring that, you know, if situations change, if demand softens, that, that your cash is appropriate for your business. Similarly, looking at inventory levels and uh, unused assets, you know, perhaps it's time to try to dispose of some of those assets or some of that inventory, try to sell it off um, versus, you know, keeping it in your inventory. And lastly, and this is probably one of the most important ones right now, is monitoring your product portfolios and your pricing, you know, ultimately ensuring that your price strategy is appropriate. We know that, you know, a number of businesses, a number of manufacturers are still seeing very high costs for their raw materials compared to previous years. Um, you know, and not much anticipation that those, those are going to decline back to levels that they were, you know, in 2020, 2021, or even pre-pandemic. So ensuring that you have that proper pricing strategy, you know, that that's been communicated to your customers and you are recovering those increased costs, obviously all things that can help your liquidity. Next is evaluating your cash reserves. So, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, banks, we've talked about, you know, financial advisors and their ability to help you invest, you know, understanding what you are looking for out of your cash reserves. What risk are you comfortable with? What return are you comfortable with? Um, I think Brian and Jim both indicated, you know, advisors can help you develop that strategy, develop the scenario that's going to work best for your particular situation. So maybe you are one of those individuals that, that needs some short-term liquidity. Um, you know that you're going to be pulling out of your investment uh, accounts, whether that be for retirement or for you know, a business purchase, maybe it's a piece of equipment, whatever it may be. You know, maybe you want a little bit less risk and you're, you're willing to deal with a little bit less return there as well. Those are all things that, that your financial advisor can help you plan. In addition to that advisory component is the FDIC insurance component. You know, do you want that protection? And if so, what are the proper accounts and the proper way for you to invest to ensure that you have that extra protection? Um, again, evaluating your whole cash strategy, whether it's due to the banking crisis, whether it's due to, um, you know, a potential recession, whether you just haven't done it in a number of months or years, then it's time to look back and ensure that you have a strategy that is correct for you as the owners and managers of your business or your other shareholders or stakeholders, um, you know, something to consider looking at um, as, you, as you can do so. Next up is talking about lender relationships. And you know, so many of our clients have had uh, relationships with banks over the years for, uh, you know, in, in many cases, the same bank and the same lender. Um, and, and what we're starting to see is that as credit has become tighter to obtain, more difficult to obtain, that people are looking at other options. Um, you know, people who were maybe with a large national bank are now starting to reach out and get relationships with some of the some of the mid-sized and, and community banks just to have them in their in their in their quiver, if you will. 
Um, it's always a good, uh, always a, it's always good to have relationships with multiple lenders because some lenders, even exclusive of any type of crisis, just don't like certain industries. Um, and, and we've seen that. You can have a credit officer come into a bank, a new credit officer who, for whatever reason, doesn't like the industry that you're in. And maybe you've been using that bank um, for 20 years. You have a credit officer come in, doesn't like your industry. You need to have somebody that you could turn to, and, and, and we're seeing that a lot more. There, there are a lot of there are a lot of options out there. We have relationships with, with a lot of banks, and um, there's there's many many great big banks. There's many many great mid-sized banks, and there's many many great community banks. Um, it's just you know what, where's where's the best fit? And sometimes as your business changes, your your uh, fit. Might be, maybe it moves from a community bank to a mid-sized bank or a mid-sized bank to a, to a national bank. Um, but it's always good to have those, those relationships and to have, as somebody said to me, their business by being in second place, um, same thing, you, you want to have somebody in second place in the lending relationship. And I think it gets down to relationship. Um, you got to have people that are, responsive that they can communicate um, you know uh, more and more we're seeing uh, we're, we're seeing virtual relationships and you know, some people just don't like that they want the, the, the in-person contact so um, maybe some people do uh, but I think a key component I mentioned is that they that the bank that you're dealing with from a, from a lending standpoint is Compatible with your industry, uh, with what you do, and that they are, they are not adverse to that. Um, but you know, it's definitely a time to. Um, I, I won't say re-examine your, your your lending relationships, but it's definitely a time to uh, take a close look and make sure that you understand where you are. And and even you know, with the line of credit, um, you know, when is that line of credit due to expire? Maybe start talking to the bank sooner rather than later to see about getting it renewed. Um, talk to them and, and see what their current credit outlook is. Um, and we're glad to help you with that. I guess then we'll go on to maybe let Brian talk about the uh, financial advisor relationships. Yeah, so um, at HBKS, uh, you know, we are uh, registered financial advisors, and one of the the things that uh, we believe sets us apart is that we are independent, and we don't have any inherent conflicts of interest, uh, because our job is to, uh, you know, we are held to a higher standard than a a brokerage firm, uh, where we have to do um, what is in the best interest of our clients. Um, which is different than most other, uh, you know, brokerage firms that are not registered investment advisors. Um, they only have to do something that is appropriate for those clients, not necessarily the best thing for their clients. We, uh, whenever we went through our SEC audit uh, a year ago, um, you know, the uh, the SEC came in and looked and made sure that. Uh, we every investment we make for our clients was the best option available for them at that moment, and we are held to that high standard, uh, which we would do anyway. Um, but it, it it helps to have you know the SEC making sure that uh, we we um, are ad, uh, adhere to that. Um, you know, and whenever we do take on a client. Uh, investment management is one of the primary things that we do. It's that it's. Uh, you know, that's mainly my role within the firm is managing our clients' assets. Uh, but we do a lot, a lot of other things, not just um, managing their assets. You know, we do help our clients with financial planning, with retirement planning, with estate planning, with, uh, uh, with our partners at HBK, with, uh, with tax planning, um, and, and, we have throughout the HPK and HPKS groups, we have 
uh, you know, many different areas of the firm that we can bring in as experts, um, you know, as Jim has done in bringing me in to, on this conversation. We do that across the firm. Um, but the main thing that I do for our clients is to work with them to develop uh, an appropriate asset allocation uh, based on their their unique risk tolerance and, and unique um, financial position. It's not a cookie cutter approach where we're putting people in models. Um, we work with each and every one of our clients to determine what the best investments are for them. Um, you know, we, we also believe that for many of our higher net worth clients, that an allocation to private funds uh, is is very helpful, especially with the volatile uh, public markets. Um, there's a real opportunity in private funds not only to increase our clients' expected return, but also to lower the volatility. So we've been doing a lot of work over the last three to five years in identifying top-flight private equity, private credit um, managers that we are uh, investing our clients' assets in. So, um, you know, it goes beyond just the traditional stock and bond portfolios um, for our most sophisticated clients. Um, but, again, those are things that can only be identified once we sit down and, and have a conversation. Okay. I believe we have one final poll question. Do you need CP credit? Check yes or no. And that about wraps it up for today. Amy, you have any questions? Uh, no, I just want to thank Brian for joining us. Um, obviously, Brian has a wealth of knowledge on this subject, and we really appreciate him sharing it with, with everybody on our call today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Brian and um, Amy, and look forward to having everyone back next month. I don't know if we have a date for our May. It'll be the third Wednesday, third Wednesday of May. Of May. <laughs> Whatever that date is, that's what it'll be. All righty. Thanks again, everybody.